know that our trustees have a number of questions for you guys too. So thank you. So thank you for having us. So how we set this up um, um, was we, we let um, Naraki Smith know they had about a half an hour and uh, Denise about 15 minutes because you guys have your exec session at seven and we wanted to try to get to that as uh, on time. And I know there's some questions, so let's get Great. started. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Um, do you want to start with us or with Denise? Well, since Denise only has 15 minutes, why don't you let her present and go? Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Works. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Denise. Hi, how's everyone? Well, very well. Thank God. Okay. Um, I just want to um, say to everyone that um, North Shore is conducting everything business as usual with the accounts payable process. And uh, we're still following, excuse me, we're still following all the same controls that we normally do um, during uh, regular times in the pandemic time right now. And um, just want to um i did send over a report an excel report which gave um a year-to-date um overview of our exceptions and the report is showing a very low exception rate um through the nine months that i've given you the data um for year-to-date exceptions there are 20 all together and then as of march um We've uh, we've produced four thousand one hundred fifteen checks were processed. The error exception rate is point three one percent, which is one third of one percent. And then the dollar exception rate is point zero five percent. In comparison to last year, um, we are running lower than we were. In the exception rate last year, 1819 was 0.53%, and dollar exception was 0 0.10. So we're trending lower uh, at this nine month mark. And I think the staff should be commended for all the hard work that they've been doing with Olivia at the, the realm. And um, I don't know if there's any questions that you may have. I do send my reports on a monthly basis, and uh, I meet with you both, all of you, on twice a year. So, great, thank you so much. Yes, no, the report was very heartening to see that we managed to bring the exception rate even a little bit lower. Uh, it gives us a lot of confidence. Trustees, do you have any questions? I think they're good. It was very okay. straightforward. Thank you so much, Denise. Right, really thank, you. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess yeah, we can uh, start our presentation. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Hold on, Dimitri. I'm try I apologize. You can't see me, can you? No. Because mm, I keep no. click just I keep I keep clicking the camera. It turns on and it's turning off. And I've been on the these calls constantly, as like we all have, and I haven't had a problem. So I do apologize. I can't see me right now. Um, but anyway, I'm here, and I even have a jacket on. <laughs> So, um, we'll get started. Dimitri, if you want to start, I'll try to fix the camera as we're talking, but otherwise, uh, I'm here. Um, all We have prepared an executive summary for this meeting, and I wanted to ask if we can share it. Sure, absolutely. You're just doing that a screen share? Sure, okay. Yeah, Okay. Uh, 
Do you guys see it? Yes. Yes, I see it. It's a little small on this end. I don't know if you can enlarge it a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try right now. Okay. There. I think that's, <laughs> that's better. Yeah, so we prepared a two-page executive summary uh, to facilitate <laughs> this meeting. Uh, and, uh, you know, we also can go through the detail in the body of the report. So um, this is our initial risk assessment for the district. Uh, we prepared it as of February 2020. The risk assessment presents uh, for the district its risk profile and it identifies risks you know, for the district and areas to focus. Through the risk assessment, we obtain an understanding of the business processes and we also present recommendations for any areas that need improvement. So our, and this is a state mandate function, you know, that requires the districts, you know, to have a risk assessment and uh, in that uh, evaluation, one of the uh, processes within the internal controls of the district. Um, our risk rating approach is to have three types of risk rating like high, moderate, and low. Uh, so for some educational purposes here, what do we mean a risk? Uh, we mean that uh, there is an area where, for example, there is no policies in place, there's no checks and balances or segregation of duties, there is no oversight. So there is a high risk for incorrect payments or for something to go wrong. On the other side, we'll have a low risk rating where we're gonna represent an area that has policies in place, has controls, has procedures, has oversight, and there is a low risk for something to go wrong. Um, our risk assessment includes 19 business processes and each one of them has its own subcategories and in total, there are like 85 subcategories. Um, as a function of the, as the internal audit function, when we started you know, in 2006, the areas were 10 that we looked at. And over the years, we have expanded to uh, right now 19, and we will continue to um, grow this area based on new trends, new requests from clients, and things that we see within the school district industry and also from uh, the state controller's office. Um, during the risk assessment, we interview key personnel that are responsible for these uh, business process and categories. So in the table here, we have listed uh, the people that we have interviewed, starting with the superintendent of schools, uh, superintendent for business and for curriculum instruction, all the way to uh, senior account clerks, for example, like in the business office, personnel and payroll. Um, during the risk assessment, we also review the documents. Uh, so we get an understanding of the flow of these documents within the various departments. And we have listed here a sample of them, such as like the organizational charts, our order reports, or uh, policies, procedures, uh, uh, permission reports, financial statements, uh, bank recs, um, you know, payroll reports, and so forth. Um, and we have certain scoring variables that we consider when we do our risk grading analysis. So like we look at the operations, whether they're significant or have been any changes, where we look at the transactions, how voluminous they are, or how complex they are, we take into account management's oversight. Uh, we looked at external uh, compliance with the regulations, uh, the systems, if they're efficient, uh, the access to a certain uh, user access rights, um, the staffing, you know, we look at their experience, their training, uh, the results, as I said, the priority reports and applicable corrective action plans if needed. So on the second page of this executive summary, we are showing you the results of our initial risk assessment. So as I said, we looked at 19 areas, uh, 85 
uh, subtotal or subcategories. Um, and in the small table that we see here, we see that we have zero high ratings. And I want to point out that, you know, that's a good score when you have zero high ratings. Uh, and, you know, you have 76 low ratings, which is um, almost like 90% of these subcategories that we looked at. And it shows that the district has good internal controls and processes in place. Uh, the nine moderate areas that we looked at, and you know, we can show you more in the table below, is areas that we believe um, can be improved. And we have specific recommendations for each one of them. Um, in this big table, we'll show you all these 19 areas, you know, starting from governance and planning, budget and development, all the way to safety and security. Um, we have showing you a detail of the low ratings, the moderate ratings, and there is zero high ratings. But we also have seven recommendations within our initial risk assessment, um, which, which is actually another good sign. You know, typically, when we do initial risk assessments in our, and it's our first round within the district, we typically have a lot more than seven recommendations. And to come to your district and, and see these internal controls, and, and this small number of recommendations, um, it's a good sign that the district is like a tight ship. Um, so we can talk about more of the recommendations in a bit, um, but with this risk assessment and based on the work that we have done so far, all these interviews and the records that we have looked at, we also um, assess the internal audit plan that we're going to have for the remaining of the fiscal year and for future and uh, where we can spend more time and do more in in-depth analysis and we have listed these two areas for your consideration uh, food services and extra classroom activity fund so any questions so far um sure on this initial risk assessment i did have one um I, I see your recommendations for the extracurricular activity fund um, and food service. I understand why you'd recommend those, but I was also curious about the um, why the facilities and capital projects, the record keeping and reporting didn't make the list. Like in our past, you guys are new with us, but in our past meetings, we talked a lot about the amount of capital work that we have going on and the fact that we have a, bond issue that's current and the fact that capital projects involve a tremendous amount of money where it's not all areas do. So I was curious about how we decided not to include that bit either, really it looks like either this year or next. Okay, uh, a very good question. Um, you know, we, did have an extensive interviews, you know, with your uh, business office regarding you know the cost of the capital projects, but also with uh, John Hall and Janet, and you know we had the assessment and you know that you know the controls are in place, you know, in regarding to monitoring these projects uh, throughout you know the the entire phases, including getting uh, approvals for change orders, um, but also from the beginning process where we're making plans with the architect. So, uh, however, this is a draft and this is you know, our suggestions. If the audit community wants us to look at capital projects, we will be more than happy to look at it more in depth. You know, we have specific audit programs that can go into this area in depth and, you know, provide you with more information about these capital projects and the controls. Thank you. Because it's only, you're right, it's a handful of moderate risk items, right? It's only nine. Um, there is absolutely a cluster of them with the extracurricular activity fund, but given the dollars and the timing with the bond and given the board's past conversations, I would certainly be very interested in looking at the capital projects. But trustees, do you feel otherwise? 
Well, to build on that, I think one thing we had talked about publicly past was um, our costing and our estimating process, which is uh, tied into that. Um, and I think having a look at that would would fit, especially as we are on the on the cusp of of, uh, of this big bond project. Um, it could it, it could be of help to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I, personally, we do have uh, an extra layer on our estimating that many uh, school districts do not have, which is we have an independent cost estimator. Um, so I think that that's not an area where we have a lot of room. I think the extra for abuse, I think the area where there's abuse is extracurricular funds and food service because they're the one of the few areas that involve cash. <clears throat> And cash is certainly a risk. She's not wrong. Um, I would add on looking at capital projects that it came up, um, it'll come up later in the agenda when we're talking about the bid process, but I think there's also possibly some confusion about bid processes during a pandemic, et cetera, that also makes me concerned about the capital projects. Okay. But yeah, I think definitely I think the benefit of it isn't just, um, isn't just uh, for, for abuse, but also for best practices. Um, and I think from that perspective, it would be good to have us an outside internal view. Yeah, this is Darren speaking. I apologize that I can't get this camera to work. Um, but yeah, it was unique that you had an outside, you know, estimator involved. So that was interesting to see um, as well. Uh, but if there's any, you know, concerns or an interest in having a, you know, a another perspective or our view of something from the past or how things are being handled in the near future, uh, we can certainly design something to, to do that um, if, if that's what um, the committee wishes. It's not a problem at all. I'm mainly interested in the item that you guys flagged, which is record keeping and reporting. Um, and then likewise, if there's any issue with bid processes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can do that. And is your concern on bid processes um, just during this immediate time period where, um, you know, we're in this pandemic situation and things might not um, always be as smooth as would be in the past or in a normal situation? I would say even before this, just and mm -hmm. with no I don't have any reason to have cause for concern whatsoever, except okay. we have a bond that's passed, right? So it's, whereas we always have a lot of capital work, it just becomes all the more important that we're really following absolute best practices now. And I think it just gets complicated by the fact that we now have executive orders that further change the rules on how you handle it. Yeah, I would agree. It's, and it's across the board. There's a lot of um, uh, controls that are changing to keep operations moving. And that's as in any organization. Controls are being, um, um, I, I, I just lack of a better word, you know, possibly weakened because we need to keep business going in any organization. And that creates. Um, a risk there or an opportunity to look at a best practice situation uh, when all the um, um, controls are not available to you. Uh, so yeah, it would make sense if, if that's a concern. Um, we've had districts asking us similar things in other areas as well, because um, you know they're trying to just do normal business operations, but it's interrupted by trying to you know, get a thousand laptops out to to students and how are they going to control that uh, when people, when life gets back to whatever the new normal is. Uh, right now they just want to get laptops in, in students' hands and that was the first priority, but the controls around that become the second priority. Yeah. Uh, so if things like that come to your attention, certainly bring them up, uh, but we can, um, you know, add in at a minimum the record keeping reporting line item and the bid process, um, you know, as a, as a review of uh, the capital projects piece. Thank you. Yeah, and and along with that, we had um, uh, toward the end of our policy meetings last, uh, as we wrap that up, 
Um, we were not able to kind of come to a conclusion on the different dollar thresholds um, for RFPs and RFQs versus um, a minimum number of bids versus discretionary. Um, I think that policy also could use uh, could could use some outside assistance, or at least review. Sure. Okay. Thank you. One of the um, as we we're talking about this and all our different line items, um, one of our other managers in our firm took it upon herself, um, and she looked into. Um, she surveyed actually 27 of our school district clients um, and did some research and found in terms of pandemic planning, um, only seven of the 27 had um, a policy in place for that prior to. So um, in considering what the future looks like, um, you know, is there a policy in place in, um, you know, in the, in the, safety and security area that would uh, allow for, you know, future planning. I mean, right, who could have planned for this, but they actually did have a policy uh, for pandemic planning. And, uh, um, you know, we can look into that a little bit further and see what these other districts um, have and pull some, some things together if you're interested. But, you know, in, ter in terms of getting back to uh, returning to buildings um, and, uh, looking at how that looks for operations and internal controls, it's kind of a wait and see, but when you're forced to uh, react to something, um, just as if, you know, 10, 15, 10 years ago, everyone was hot on disaster recovery for IT and uh, people have finally come around to it. You know, this might be the, the next thing people are looking at is getting policies in place um, for them. Okay. Um, now, do you, you know, we can absolutely include, you know, um, you know, capital projects in our internal auto, you know, work plan. Um, do you want to go to the actual report? You know, do you have any specific questions, you know, on the, uh, on the body of the report? I suspect yeah, I suspect people do. But are you good with your summary? We should ask specific questions now? I'm good with my summary. It was a two-page summary, but I can actually pull up the report, too, so we can go page by page if you want to. No. I, I, I mean, I would, I'm sorry. I would prefer if uh, the trustees, if they had questions, ask their questions, then we could focus on those specific areas unless someone has a different thought. Sure. Okay. I certainly do not. Marianne, do you have something specific you want to start with? No, but I just wanted to give everyone the opportunity to ask their questions. Okay. Perfectly fair. The report was pretty clear. I agree. Uh, trustees, does anyone have a question they want to lead with? And, of course, other committee members, not just trustees. I have one. On page six. You under cybersecurity vulnerability assessments, why do you rank that as a low? Given the fact that your strongest link, your strongest part is your weakest link, and that people will unfortunately compromise themselves and bad actors get information that could potentially allow them to access to the secure to the to the uh, IT world. Good. Okay. Uh, it is as a from an inherent point of view. Um, it's it high, is. but why is it low after a control? Because I've had gone through people with, with training, we can train them all day long, and at the end of the day, they still do something they shouldn't do, and lo and behold, we now have a problem. That Now I'm going to ask you, do you know something specific from the district? You know, when we did the... Just from personal background experience in my, in my corporate world that I've gone through. Okay, I understand. And we did spend a lot of time, you know, with your IT director, you know, speaking about the district's network security and the infrastructure that has been built to protect the network from outside vulnerabilities, such as, um, you know, intrusion attacks. And we 
know that the district um, has implemented you know, a strong firewall protection, but it also has external ongoing monitoring assessments from the Department of Homeland Security. These are monthly vulnerability assessments that um, help the district to identify any potential weaknesses within the district's network. And those are very helpful because it helps you know, to give information to the district to uh, patch if needed any open ports or strengthen any other firewall uh, configuration parameters. Um, the district has a disaster recovery plan in place, has backup and restoration procedures in place. So in case of an attack and loss of data, the district has the capability to retrieve that information and not bring an interruption to your business, like not being able to cut checks for accounts payable or payroll, or even uh, bring an interruption to your uh, student data management system and not have access to student attendance, registration, or you know, some great information. Um, there is um, and there is a lot of platforms now that they're not hosted on the district server. They're hosted on the cloud through the web-based, and they are um, in cooperation, you know, with these vendors and you know, uh, you know, with uh, um, you know, with the platforms like you know, WinCap, Transfire, Office 65, and the Google Drive. These are all backed up on their service as well and they're easy and they can be retrieved you know to the district you know if needed um but i did want to talk about in addition to that you know that there is you know uh on the on the interaction to the outside world from the inside from the employees there is well filtering in place there is um you know malware uh protection and even email protection you know, for the district to protect, you know, from any um, hackers to come in. But you did point out about the education and the training, mm -hmm. okay, where you, there, that's the weakest link. You know, you can build a fortress and, you know, have the best technology in place, mm -hmm. have the, the strongest firewall, have, um, uh, as I said, the Homeland, you know, the Department of Homeland Security to look, in, look upon you, okay, and tell you what you need to correct. But if you have somebody now in an email looking at, you know, that they got a gift card from Amazon and they get attracted and they click on that link, you, you know, there is the attack happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we did discuss about this and we know that the district is putting a training plan for its employees, you know, about how to use, how to be careful on the emails, how to be careful on their social media accounts so they don't bring that threat into the district. We talked about, you know, implementing no before. If you're familiar with it, you know, we use it in our firm as well, where there is um, uh, training, you know, provided to all employees, and there is an automatic training to new employees, you know, to um, receive the same information and the same training, uh, and also acknowledgement of the district's uh, computer use policy. Um, and there is the training also um, creates, or the platform creates um, phishing emails on its own. So the employees may get a, a phishing email that it's kind of engineer to a specific department or to the specific habits of the employee. And if they click on it, then they go to a remedial training. So that will create, you know, or will elevate better set the maturity level, you know, within the district regarding the user activity within the network. We believe through all this uh, assessments and all these controls in place that it was a low risk for the district. Is two-factor authentication occurring? Um, I'm looking here. So even though the training is in place, um, even at our own firm, we 
Dimitri and I actually oversee it in our firm, and we uh, we get the notices when people click. And uh, during while people have been working home, we've had some people click who customer normal normally would never click. We you know this, so I think they get caught off guard. They're maybe home a little bit more comfortable or uncomfortable. Um, and uh, we had some clickers that we wouldn't have expected. Um, so. You know, you can't control people's actions and reactions um, on a day-to-day -day basis. You can just do your best to keep them aware, uh, keep their antennas up. As far as the two-factor authentication, it's on the online banking system. Okay. And just throwing this out, I know Rockville Center had a problem with their uh, where their entire service pretty much got locked up due to ransomware. If that was to occur in our school district, uh, could we potentially restore everything very quickly or would we, would we be in Rockville Center situation? We had the same conversation with the IT director and you know we discussed about the restoration procedures of you know the backup you know to get the information. But you have you know WinCap that it's also stored within and it's part of your disaster recovery plan, but it's also stored, you know, on WinCap's servers, so that's easily to get it back. Okay, so it will bring minimal interruption to your school district operations. Okay, that's very important because I know they they had to pay the the, the ransomware to or, or to get the files back. Right, but their structure is very different than what it is in um, you know Northport, and a lot of districts have learned from that district to correct and enhance the, their current ones. Um, there's other districts uh, out east that got hacked and ransomware and they were out for a mm -hmm. month. Yep. And it was hard even for us to like get in contact with them because their servers were backing up uh, their financial systems and their email systems. And uh, we did a risk assessment there, and we highlighted that. But you know, they uh, chose not to um, look at other options, and they chose to continue with their within district premises uh, backup procedures. But um, they they got hacked. Um, they had to pay a lot of legal cost. They mm -hmm. had to pay a lot of forensic digital forensic cost to understand what happened and, and then get, you know, try to get the data back. Relatively speaking to other districts that you review in terms of cybersecurity, how do we rank? Would you say we're on the top end, middle, lower range? I believe you're, you're on, on a very good rating, you know, with a low risk rating, uh, you know, and, you know, we have one recommendation there to continue these uh, training. And the, um, for from the no before and one recommendation that I go back to the IT side where you know on the hardware acquisition just to evaluate you know the technology sorry the hardware that it's been acquired because that's also could be potential security risk mm -hmm. um, where if there is a better control of acquiring the IT equipment before they getting onto the network because you want the IT director to approve these equipment purchases to make sure that they're in sync with the district security protocols before you put them on the network. So um, it's all about communication to making sure that we're, you know, uh, the IT director is aware of that. Um, so I feel like you're in a very good spot you know, in regard to IT and cybersecurity. Um, I have other districts that, you know, they don't have a disaster recovery plan or their cybersecurity plan, okay, doesn't meet yet the new ed law criteria that, you know, has very good guidance of how the district should be secure, you know, and, you know, protect the um, personal identifiable information. Um, so there is, they need to catch up. But I believe North North Shore has a good um, has a good infrastructure in this in this regard. 
Great. Thank, Thank you. you for that question, because I think we've all seen attempted cyber attacks and just even regular spam through the roof since this started. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Any members, other questions? I, I did have a question. Am I, uh, am I on? Yeah. Um, on page 11, you wrote that you conduct limited key control testing in the bank reconciliation area. Can you just okay. tell us what that entails and, and a little bit more about that? Yes. So good question. And uh, we talk about key control testing. The key control testing is actually limited testing. You know, we select it, you know, um, uh, for, for, as a sample, like certain months that, you know, we had bank reconciliations. Um, it wasn't like, you know, an in-depth cycle audit on the accounting reporting and the revenue to look at, you know, in-depth in, in, in these areas. But as an initial risk assessment, uh, we always want to look at the district's bank reconciliation. So that's you know where we do testing, a sample testing of the bank records. And what do we do? We look you know, whether the district has a process of doing a bank reconciliation, you know, from the bank statements to the general ledger, making sure that they can record any outstanding checks, any deposits in transit, make sure that there's a process that the reconciliation is reviewed by someone and signed off. And, um, you know, that also reflects in the treasurer's report, you know, when the board receives them. So it's an important process to have in place. We want to make sure that they're done timely, okay, which we did see it. And it, we were very happy. Um, I can tell you other districts are three to four months behind. Okay. Yeah. But it's important to say this because of the, uh, you know, you have uh, a very, good and organized business office and you know sometimes you know um the number of staff you know and the amount of work that each one is doing you know and the separate hats that we're wearing doesn't allow us you know to do everything you know in a timely manner or in an efficient manner but you know, we came and we saw that you know the these bank breaks were done and they were timely so we were very happy to see that so you would look at, would you, we have several bank accounts, obviously, and they come in monthly. You look at spot check sample testing of one or two of those statements and then look at them in full to see how they, re how they, how they reconciled or, right. or a segment of, of, of many of them. No, well, we selected like a couple of months for all of these bank accounts to okay. make sure that you know, it all, they were all done and we were able to match it to the general ledger and to the treasurer's report. Okay. Um, when we do this types of testing, we have to look all the way around to, you know, go to the general ledger and to the treasurer's report. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a slightly, I have a quite different question. On page 20, where you looked at our food service program, um, school lunch programs are supposed to be self-supporting. It's my understanding that districts usually have the challenge of making sure they're bringing enough money in to cover their lunch cost. Mm -hmm. In the past four years, we've apparently had the other side of that issue, which is, you know, a pretty significant excess of revenues over expenditures, right? Like this 1819 got up to $163,000 in excess. What's your recommendation? Okay. So I think we did look at it and we didn't, we didn't, so you have a fund balance on the food service side of 371,000, right? So cumulative, right. 1819 loan was 163,000, it's piled up to 371. Right. So it's, you know, te the law says that, you know, you, the fund balance should not be more than uh, the three month average of you know the total expenditures so it's um right now your fund balance is three hundred seventy one thousand dollars you know a quick calculation of the three month average is around three hundred and you know forty five thousand almost um it's slightly over um but things happen you know and now we have pandemic and you know these food service expenditures are going to be very high so this year might be very different. 
And so things can change, you know, from year to year. Yes, we just, and I wouldn't bring it up if we didn't have such a consistent trend. Right, but we're probably going to have an issue this year with the pandemic mm -hmm. because you are paying people without revenue coming in. We do have whatever subsidies we get for mm -hmm. free and reduced lunch, but we have hazard pay. We have transportation workers delivering mm -hmm. food. So, I mean, normally it would be a concern, but given the fact that they are talking about a possible second wave of COVID-19, um, I don't know that we should take remedial action at this time, we also don't know what the food prices are well, going to be. Right. And I don't think the board's going to decide what to do, but it's an opportunity for the auditor to comment on it because so that we can make some decisions going forward. Right. Because we could talk all night about how it's also going to be a lot of people have lost their jobs. And right. so everything's more expensive and you might want to be able to reduce the price of lunch. So, right. We're going to make this decision down the road. But while we have the auditors here, let's just. Yeah, that's right. And as the year as the year closes out, this is something that your external auditors will without a doubt look at. If you're above that threshold, you know, they'll make that comment um, at the end of the fiscal year reporting. Uh, and that you'll have to have a corrective action plan for that. But um, it's probably unlikely you'll be in that situation that you're in. Superintendent? Yeah. Um, so, Darren and Demetrius, can you um, did you look at the extent to which the the spike in eighteen nineteen um, was related to um, a person to us not paying a, per, a key personnel cost in food service? Um, Doctor, like we didn't. Um, no, we didn't look in more in detail. You know to. Okay. You know, look at you know why the reason you know, and the increase in expenditures. Uh, but if you want, you know, we can uh, spend more time on it. Yeah, I'd be my the reason why I ask is I'd be interested to know if the uh, particularly the the spike in those years what role that played. Okay. Because we had a we had a um, an administrator out not being paid for an extended period of time. If we do that, then you're going to want to project where we're going to end up this year, too. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we can include that in our in our work in the uh, food services area. Thank you. Thank you. Committee members, your questions, please. Hi. Um, I just have a quick question. I just wanted to just um, because this is the first time through all this, so the internal auditors, all the interviews you did, those were just this first time through. I mean, I know you, you review prior work papers, which is from a kind of independent, your own take on everything. I know you consider prior work papers, but just from a kind of independent standpoint, all the interviews you did with everyone, those were just right out of the box sitting down with your laptop or notebook or however everyone does it now. When I audited, it was on paper, but <laughs> I'm sure yeah. you're typing. But um, that was all, you know, first time around, fresh, independent interviews with everyone. Yeah. Yeah. This was the first time we had met um, everyone there in the key positions. And um, Lois kept us on schedule. You know, we were in, we had a very uh, nice schedule set up for about three days uh, in, in the – cafeteria in the lunchroom slash uh, conference room. Um, so we got to meet people as they were coming in for their food and coffee as well. But uh, yeah, it was the first time sitting down. We've had, we had questionnaires uh, that we go through that lead us to, um, you know, open dialogue discussions about, um, uh, you know, current events going on and things uh, related to internal controls and processes. Um, and, then, and, you know, we start off each interview by, getting understanding of everyone's experience, how long they've been at the district and carrying out such related duties, whether it's at the district or, or prior employment, um, so we can get to know each other. But yeah, this is the first time we met everyone and um, we had a chance to document all the processes that you see in the report. Um, that, that's really where that 
came from. And then those that we call key controls, we go back and test those on a limited basis. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Like, likewise, can I just say, this is the first time we're seeing your report. I appreciate the report. It was clear, it was easy to read. I uh, Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Absolutely, thank you. Um, trustees we're, and committee members, we are about out of time. Does anyone have else have something pressing to ask before we wrap up? Uh, I'd just like to say to Olivia, thank you very much for an excellent report as usual. It's greatly appreciated and your hard work clearly is demonstrated in these reports. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. And thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Ray and Katie, for joining us for the committee meeting. We appreciate it. And for a really concise and clear report, we really appreciate everyone's time this evening. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone at the district. It was great um, to have everyone really staying on schedule and being very open and talking to it uh, and being cooperative with all the follow-up uh, requests and everything. So made the process go quick smoothly. So thank you. That's great to hear. Thank you so much for that feedback. We really appreciate it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Right. Thank you. Enjoy your night. You too. Good night. Thank you. And that's adjourned the audit committee meeting. <laughs> okay. So we need a motion to win the executive session. Motion. Uh, we've got a, um, do we have the language? Um, motion to go into executive session to consider discussions regarding the appointment of a particular person or persons. And collective bargaining. And collective bargaining, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye loudly. Aye. 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 All right. We move to the